Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India continue on our uh, module on uh, pigment and we have already started talking about the importance of the images in ajanta the mural paintings so with their uh, uh, both like the figurative as well as the symbolic value we'll also look into the ways in which the compositions are constructed and there is this one image what we have here on screen and that comes from uh, mahajana kajataka and this also comes from the cave one and which was made perhaps between 4th and 5th centuries in Ajanta and in this one as we have already seen that I mean how there are those narrative murals which are there on the walls of Ajanta and this is also not a exception and in this one what we have here that there is a trace of the doorway that we have in the lower part of the image and on the upper part we have the entire narrative which is running. So there, are, there is this uh, story of Mahajanaka we find that in the left part of the image there is this uh, royal pavilion and in which uh, Mahajanaka is seated and then there are the figures who are attending to him. And then there is also that how there is a there are more traces of the of the architectural structures around them. So the use of the pillars, the use of the uh, the the bars, and so on. And then how the built structures were there. It it gives us a sense of that in the fourth and fifth century. And then apart from this shaded pavilion, uh, what we have in the entire um, the other other part of the images uh, that there is this musical performance and the dance performance that is taking place. And here we have there are a group of musicians and dancers they are involved in uh, performing for uh, Mahajanaka. And the story goes as like when Mahajanaka ha had been there and, um, and then uh, of course that I mean there had been attempts in distracting him or making him more and more interested in the material life and that is the reason the, um, the beautiful women were employed for performing for him. So that I mean the beautiful dancers and musicians would be there and so that he can also be engaged in music, dance and the beauty around him. However, as we know that I mean in this Jataka story that he had also renounced everything and embraced the path of asceticism. So, this is something that we find those those are part of this continuous narrations and something in, in this one we find that I mean this had already been established in the Ajanta, the murals of Ajanta. So something similar we have already seen in Sanchi where there are uh, those continuous narrative panels and in which one character appears multiple times and in this one what we see that I mean there are many different parts of the uh, entire palace complex or parts of the narrative which come into this one particular frame. So for example here if we see towards the left corner there is a toilet scene in which we see there are two women they are getting prepared perhaps for being in front of Mahajanaka. It can also be possible that they are the ones who are the performers and after uh, being prepared after preparing themselves in the toilet and then they appear here at the center stage for the performance. So it can be a way in which there are multiple temporalities which are which are added to this these images. So it is not just one particular scene does not really talk about one particular temporality or a time, but there can be multiple temporalities in this kind of compositions. And is the same time there are also overlapping of different kind of structures and 
narratives. So, for example, we do not really see uh, the foreshortening or the kind of western perspective that we have in images, but here we see a kind of perspective which can be uh, a mix of bird's eye view as well as something that is there on our eye level. So, there are multiple stages in which the narrations go on and the perspective is not the defining factor for making the images, but the narrative or the criteria for making a narrative is more important than uh, having those scientific precisions. So, that is the reason what we find that I mean the kind of perspectival view that is employed here is also uh, multiple and it, it is not really one or the other, but many things at the same time very similar to what we have also spoke about temporalities. Now, here we also see there are a range of uh, pigments which are used, but the thing is that I mean if we see them closely, then we understand that I mean there are some of those basic pigments which are used for example, for red, for umber brown and for white and yellow and a green. Those are the ones which are also mixed and matched and they are also applied very carefully, so that uh, an illusion of this, an illusion of the palace in or uh, an illusion of the natural world can be created by the means of, of these paints. Also, as we can see here, there is a very limited use of blue, which uh, brings us uh, back to what we have already discussed about the economic and social value of lapis lazuli. From there we see that I mean there is this one of the most celebrated images in the caves of Ajanta and that is Bodhisattva Padmapani. So, we have already discussed the idea of Bodhisattva and the compassionate ones and in this case what we find that there is this one particular figure that is uh, under uh, uh, that is named as Bodhisattva Padmapani and Padma is the lotus and Pani means hand. So, the, the Bodhisattva who has a lotus in his hand is called Bodhisattva Padmapani and this figure appears in one of the ceilings in cave 1 and we can also see that I mean how this figure is situated by this doorway which appears at the left corner of the slide in uh, of the image in left. Now, what we have here this mighty figure of Bodhisattva Padmapani here we find that uh, there is this compassionate being Bodhisattva, he is depicted here with utmost care and details. And here we find that I mean he is made almost into this uh, Trivanga pose or the tri-body vent in which we find the first vent is there in his shoulder and then there is this vent that goes until his waist and then it bends again here. So, there are three bends which are introduced in this body and that is the reason it is called Trivanga. Now, apart from this particular thing, we also see that there are, there is this implementation of Indian artistic anatomy that is here very much prevalent. Now, what are those Indian artistic anatomy? As I have already started talking about the Indian standards, I mean the, the, the standards of beauty during this time in the Indian subcontinent in the 4th and 5th century AD we see that how the faces are constructed. So, for example, it is somewhere between naturalism and idealism as we can see that there is this unibrow which we have already spoken about which looks like a bow, right. And then we also have the eyes which almost look like lotus petals. So, these are the kind of like I mean the characteristic features that we find there and of course, we, we also see there are those long ear lobes which, which are also been there as part of the iconography of both in not both I mean in all, in the all uh, major religions in, uh, in the Indian subcontinent during this time as for example, we find it in uh, Buddhism, in Jainism as well as in Hinduism and the long eye, ear lobes are marker of intelligence as well as the ones who would listen to the, the devotees 
and that is the reason the the long ear lobes have been there as part of the iconography so in this image we find that the iconography this different beauty standards as well as the uh, the study from the uh, nature they are all combined together to to form this a uh, magnificent image of Bodhisattva Padmapani and what all we find there is that I mean he is shown as a royal figure as I have already mentioned it earlier and for that reason we see this jeweled crown that is there on the on the top of his head and then he is also uh, bejeweled and um, there are those uh, pearl necklaces in his uh, in uh, around his neck as well as there are other ornaments that we see in his upper arm and his lower arm and so on and in the lower part of the body we find that there are decorated textiles which are, which which also adorn his body so this this features that we do not see in the body of buddha but those will be there in in the form uh, in in the figure of bodhisattva now what all we see in bodhisattva padmapani's figure is that i mean it's not just about the details of um, the facial features and the beauty standards and so on but his emotion has been depicted here very carefully also that i mean how uh, it, it can it is careful but at the same time it is not rigid it is um, it it sort of uh, impacts upon the viewer's um, uh, mind when when we look at it so um, what we see here this his slightly drooping head and then his uh, half closed eyes and this the stillness in his face all these things are matched by his slight gesture with his hand that i mean how he holds the lotus very carefully at the same time i mean um, the softness in his gesture and his in his uh, facial expression and and in his body all these things are there which are marker of the compassion so since the bodhisattva is compassionate towards all the living beings in the world and that is the reason this kind of emotion had been depicted and successfully implemented in this image we also see some of the other um, traits so for example that how his his shoulders are broad like the vrishas kanda the term that i have already used and then his waist is really narrow which is also compared to um, the waist of the lion which is called simhakati and uh, the vrishas kanda and simhakati these are the other two uh, the, the the standards of beauty that we find and also we find that the arms are uh, long so they almost touch the knees so that is also something that that we find to be part of the this indian artistic anatomy so all those things are brought here together so having this vrishas kanda and simhakati which which show the broad shoulder and the heroic figure and then a mix of this heroism with his compassionate expression this two are a blend between two uh, almost uh, you know opposing emotions or like opposing bhavas so that is something that we find that the ajanta the artisans in ajanta were successful to bring them together his broad shoulders do not disturb his emotion however his emotion does not make him look frail so this this two things were balanced in this way in this particular um, figure of bodhisattva of padmapani and that is perhaps some of the uh, one of the reason why we find that i mean this, this kind of assimilation is rare in the visual depictions in, in india as well as across the world now his figure the way this monumental figure of bodhisattva padmapani is uh, made here then this monumental figure is then complemented by all the different kind of details around him so the f uh, the focus that stays on to the figure but then we also see that i mean who all are situated around him so there are two very uh, you know th th there are two important attendant figures that we find there are other figures and part of the other narrations that starts from here and then this two figure we find that their uh, attention is is upon bodhisattva so that is that is also a visual marker for for the audience to look at the bodhisattva through the eyes of these devotees then 
we see that there are some of the architectural uh, parts which are which are shown here which also gives us a sense of the space and the depth of it now what we find here also interesting is that even though this some of the figures they look like the earthly beings as well as the architecture that we find that that also uh, comes uh, similar to the ones that perhaps the people during 4th and 5th century they had around them. But then that is also matched by figures which are not seen around us and that is the images of the Kinnaras, the Gandharvas as well as the other celestial beings who are considered to be the flying ones, the ones who shower their blessings or like I mean they, they greet the, uh, the deities from the heaven or from the sky. So that is the reason we find that I mean this particular Kinnara figure is there uh, in the in the upper side of this um, uh, in the upper uh, um, side of this image, and but it is not really that uh, very clearly distinguished from the ones that that we see around us. For example, the architecture, the depiction of the trees, and so on. So it's almost like a mix of the material world and the spiritual world. So all the all the different details that we see around this image that is not really from one particular kind of society but i mean this is uh, it's a, it's a amalgamation of different narrations or different communities and uh, of course like i mean the um, the how the humans did they, they come together with the with the celestial beings to greet um, this this compassionate being so there are different as i have already said that there are multiple conceptions of space and multiple temporalities which are there in these images and that come alive in the image of bodhisattva padmapani now this other image I wanted to um, show here and this is an image from um, uh, one of the ceiling murals in, in cave 17 and uh, this, is a, this, is, this is also the cave which was, which was painted perhaps between like 6th and 7th century and so on. And in this one what we have here there is part of the ceiling decoration. So in the ceiling decoration unlike the one that we have on the, on the walls we have more of decorative and the ornamental motifs. So for example, there are uh, vegetation, there are flowers, there are creepers, there are different kind of animals, but mostly we do not really see any kind of narration being depicted on the ceilings. And that is for uh, the reason that I mean we do not really raise our heads all the time to read a narration. The, if we have the narration uh, on the eye level or like I mean uh, if they are vertically then that becomes easy for the viewers to see them, to read them and spend time with them. So that is the reason there are two different kind of strategies which were employed for making the paintings on the wall and then a different strategy is there for painting on the ceiling. Now as part of making this Buddhist paradise what we have here on the ceilings that there is there is a priority of this different kind of creepers, different kind of flora and fauna and uh, some of the central medallions that we find here and this one I find particularly interesting is because that it is a circular medallion like structure that we have on the, on the center of the ceiling and in this one there is a blend of uh, figurative motifs with the ones which are ornamental. So there are this uh, figures that we have here and they fit into this uh, you know the, the petals which are there uh, which sort of frame them but they appear as the celestial beings but also they seamlessly merge into the decorative programmatic of, of the entire um, image. So these are, these are some of the characteristic features that we find there and how it is not only just the depiction of emotion or bringing temporalities and spaces together that were the priorities of the Ajanta painters, but it was also this, this kind of experimentations in which we find how the decorative motifs were brought together with um, perhaps um, you know the, the figurative motifs. So these are the other forms of experimentation and um, I would say the successful experimentations those were carried out by the artisans and painters in Ajanta. 
Now from Ajanta, if we move further, there had also been other cave sites where we find these images. Now why do we find images only in these caves? That can also be a question. I mean, it is not only caves, but I mean mostly in these caves, in these uh, excavated caves and that is because those are the places which have been safe and those are the places which were not destroyed or those are the ones which were not disturbed by people. And that is how we find that some of those cave sites, they are the ones which show the, uh, which, which show the richness of some of the earliest surviving images from the Indian subcontinent. Now, the other place from where we find some of the uh, earliest surviving uh, murals is uh, in the Sittanavasal or Chittanavasal in, uh, in, in the Pudukottai district of Tamil Nadu. Now, here we find some of the images they perhaps date back to 2nd century AD and here this is uh, the Sittanavasal or Chittanavasal caves are the Jain caves and in which we find that there have also been similar kind of strategies of making images who are important in the uh, Jaina belief. So, for example, here we have images of the Tirthankaras seated in this meditative posture and on a high uh, pedestal or a platform and then we have the images which are painted around them. So, there have there were images here and here and perhaps these images, the images of the Jaina Tirthankaras were also perhaps been coated with lime plaster and then they were painted. In the ceiling as well, we also have that there are images and both in, in here we have images, those, those are of figurative capacity as well as the ornamental and decorative ones. And one of the images that, that we find from the ceiling is here where we find there are some of the Jaina monks who are collecting lotuses from a lotus lake. And in this one what we find there is also this tremendous amount of the, a blend between naturalism as well as something that goes beyond naturalism. So for example, here we have this highly uh, naturalistic depiction of the lotuses and with, the, with all the details of their petals, the leaves and then the slight modulation on the petals that gives us a sense of this three dimensionality. And then there are the Jaina monks here, we see them, they are collecting the lotuses perhaps for paying homage to the, to the Jaina Tithankaras. And what we find here very interesting is that uh, even though they are collecting the lotuses, the lotuses look almost oversized and um, the, the lotuses are bigger than the monks. Here we also have another, uh, you know, there is this animal figure that we have here. It is perhaps, um, it is perhaps a buffalo um, or a bull that we have here and this, this figure is also something that is done with all the possible details and modulation that, that makes it distinguishable from the other forms that we have here. So there are mo more buffaloes here and as we know that I mean how the water buffaloes and the buffaloes they love to stay in, the, in this water and in the pond and um, of course if we are talking about the, uh, the southern India I mean those, those areas are also in which like I mean the summer is pretty hot. And so, this, this is something that talks about the regional specificity and something that had been perhaps uh, the, the artisans they have observed from their surrounding and how the observation of the surrounding is brought together with a degree of idealism. And that is the reason how their, the lotuses have been um, uh, blown uh, out of proportion and then um, they sort of dwarf the images of the monks. Who, uh, and, and the images of the monks and the animals, they almost look like miniature ones in this, in this lake of lotuses. So these are some of the ways in which we find that how the different kind of visual strategies are employed and um, this blend of uh, naturalism, idealism and the, and the iconographical details, they come forward all these images. 
Another example we find is from the uh, site of the Bagh Caves and again in Madhya Pradesh and this is, this is something that we find that I mean this is a place which developed perhaps in the 5th, 6th century and so on. So unlike the Sitanavasal Caves, these Bagh Caves were predominantly Buddhist caves and here what we have that I mean uh, the murals, some of the traces of the murals were there but I mean they are uh, much in a dilapidated condition. So some of the uh, panels are actually now collected in the site museum in Bagh and then some of the details that we have here is also very interesting that uh, how um, certain this degree of the degree of the naturalism and then the dynamism and, uh, and then of course that the ornamental details, how those are brought together in the image that we see in the left side in which there is also a uh, uh, economy of color that is that is uh, we, we find that I mean the colors those are used here are mostly of uh, almost like in the monochromic scale in which there are uh, earthen red and umber or like I mean umber brown color those, those are used and we have already discussed that I mean how this kind of pigments are found in abundance in, in these areas. So we do not really have much of the use of blue similar to something that we have already seen in Ajanta that gives us a sense of how these places they have almost developed simultaneously and they have also followed similar kind of strategy for employing the pigments which are available in their vicinity as well as the pigments which were imported from outside. In the Bagh murals we also find that the images are made with this high emotion as well as the, this, this lyrical rhythm that we have there. So for that reason the, the balance, the rhythm and the, uh, the form all those things they come together in the depiction of the, the figurative narratives in this site. So altogether one can say that I mean there have been some of the overarching ideas about um, iconography and then um, the Indian artistic anatomy those were there in some uh, I mean those, those were perhaps been present in many of the sites where these paintings were created. But then we also see that I mean each of these sites have also added to some of the uh, individual details which, which not only just uh, add to the diversity of the material but also they tell us that I mean how the artisans and the artist even though they were following some of the similar kind of conventions, they were also able to employ some of their individualistic uh, approaches in, in these images. Thank you.